I'm Dan Kowalski, uh, Wes, England. I think I was l lucky enough to ask to uh, play with Dan and uh, oh, that Bear Facts. Probably the Bear Facts started with Steve Kirkman and uh, a guy by the name of Kevin Shooter. Mm -hmm. Kevin, yep. And Bob Neblon, Jim Sipe, uh, myself. I think he had Bob Corsby was the drummer. Bob Corsby, yeah, Bob mm -hmm. Corsby was there oh, before Bob Neblon. Mm -hmm. And uh, once Bob got out of it, Bob Neblon took his place. Yeah, uh, Bob and I were actually playing together with a band. And for whatever which Bob? whatever the purpose was, Bob Neblon and I were playing <coughs> together in the same band. Uh, a band called The Intruders at the time. And uh, we got a call from one of the guys. Probably Steve. They're in a band, Steve, and and uh, I, although I don't remember if Steve was with the band when we came out. Jim Seip was with the band. Steve was too, but Steve was playing bass. Okay, okay. But then shortly thereafter, Jim Seip ended up going with uh, Carl Roach and who? What band was that? That would Riddlers. be the Riddlers. The Riddlers. Yeah, but it, but most of our starting career with the bare facts for Bob, Bob Nebelong and I was with Jim Sight. Right. You and uh, uh, Dave Curtis uh, and Ron Shaw. And uh, that we played together for, for a very long time. Um, and then Jim went to the Riddlers and uh, Steve came into the band. That's the way I remember it. I, I don't know where Steve had went uh, prior to Bob and I coming over, but but Jim was a guy that was uh, the lead singer at the time. So Jim was the lead singer and Steve was playing bass. So. And then Steve decided to sing and you came to do bass. And mm -hmm. Whatever happened to Carl Roach? Do you know? I have no idea. Yeah. I think I heard he went to South Bend. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But the, um, the I, I remember the first number of years, um, Jim was the guy that was was lead singing for the Bear Facts, and, and um, it was that group of guys, Dan and Jim, Ron, uh, myself, Bob, and uh, Bob Neblong, uh, that, uh, and Ron Shaw, that, that um, Really started, really started going out and playing um, a lot, and going into Chicago and recording at uh, Universal Studios in Chicago, and and signing with our first, um, really signing with our first uh, uh, promoter, which was uh, Sun Productions out of uh, Anderson, Muncie, Anderson yeah. or, Muncie, or Muncie, somewhere, somewhere down there. Yeah. yeah. You have any stories about when you recorded anything that stands out in your mind? I wondered if it was legal. We went in there from midnight to three o'clock in the morning in downtown Chicago. Really? And uh, I think I don't know who let us in, but I think it was look, legal. I'm not sure it was. Look, looking back, <laughs> looking back, I wonder if the boss got any of that money, you know, or yeah. whether the elevator guy and the and the janitor made a thousand bucks for that three hours that night. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember it uh, was on East Walton, just off of uh, Michigan Avenue North, um, and I, I, I think I remember we did 54 takes on the first song, uh, I think it was musically, and vocally I think we did it one or two takes, and then the second song uh, went actually went fairly smoothly as far as I remember. But I, I re, back then you were doing four track recordings, even at major studios. Mm. So Beatles style. No, we were more like uh, Four Tops. Oh, okay. More like more like we did. We were more like the Buckinghams. Yeah, we had a lot of brass. Yeah. The time. Yeah. We did some. I don't think we ever did any Chicago, but yeah. I think one of the things that I think one of the things that made 
the Bear Facts at that point really unique was that we played songs that most of the bands weren't playing. I mean, we were doing Engelbert Humperdinck, and we were doing uh, the Buckinghams, and we were doing um, the... Um, uh, well, just, tears. Yeah, just a, a lot of a lot of things that were both mainstream and not so mainstream, um, uh, and uh, so I, I think. And we did a lot of uh, of um, Motown, which was unusual for a group of uh, you know six white guys. And and uh, you guys are white. Yeah, and we're yeah we're white. and we're and going into places we played, we played some places that. Uh, that uh, were pretty mixed uh, uh, audiences, and we're talking about in the uh, you know mid uh, you know late '60s. And uh, uh, I actually I always enjoyed the horns, and I think I did too. Dan, you felt the same way. And uh, we had great harmonies. Uh, so so we thought. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember though, I, you know, and that was one of the things too. I, the people that I reflect with on here, remember the high school dances, they remember the civic dances, the armory, and, and I mean, I've, I've seen the Buckinghams play at the armory before. So the memories going back then. Yeah, well, are, one of the stories that we talk about, uh, Dan, you can recollect as best you can, but uh, we opened for, we were actually playing with the Buckinghams in a group called The Flock. Uh, at a club called the Green Gorilla I in think, Chicago. I think the Flock was a local brass band yeah. in Chicago. I don't think they ever made it nationally. Yeah. Did they? But they were fantastic. Yeah, they were. Fantastic. They had a lot of brass. And uh, I don't remember if it was our opening song or our last song. And as I think back on it, uh, it, it actually is yeah. it, it probably it, almost funnier than it was at, at the time. Oh, yeah, but we played a Buckingham song. Kind of a drag. Uh, kind of a drag <laughs> as our last song. Uh, just really, I don't think we were really thinking about the fact that that the Buckinghams were going to be, you know, following coming, on right, behind coming on right behind us. So we took one of their biggest songs at the time and played it. And a lot of people don't know uh, the Buckinghams even at that time were not playing with brass, as far as I know. Uh, so, um, but we we played the song and it sounded exactly the way. The recording sounded, and we never thought, or never so we thought, a, yeah, never, or so we thought, and we never had a, uh, never thought anything about it after that. Did they ever say anything to you? Not that I remember. Not that I remember. No. I think that was no. the top deck, though, wasn't it? I don't think so. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So what other, what other bands do you remember that you either opened for or? Well, I always thought I made this up. But as it turned out, we played with Eric Clapton down in Indianapolis. Yeah. The, and what band was he? Uh, Derek and the Dominoes. Derek and the Dominoes. And we were we we were lucky enough. Uh, we had some really good promoters, uh, and we were playing the what was called the Hullabaloo circuit, and there were a lot of Hullabaloo clubs uh, around the Midwest. Um, and at that time, people that are old enough to remember on television, they had Hullabaloo and they had the Shindig. Uh, and these whole blue clubs were basically dance clubs with the girls dancing on the pedestals and, and in the cages and stuff or whatever. But um, we played a lot of those uh, type clubs. Um, and uh, we played, uh, I, I, for me, I can remember uh, the Crying Shames. Um, and I remember seeing the Crying Shames at Tipton Hall. Mm -hmm. and, they, and we also, and we played with them. Remember Tipton Hall? Oh, yeah. yeah. <coughs> we played with them uh, in Portage. I, mean, I don't think we played with them there. In Portage. Going to see them when I was kid. Yeah. And uh, the American Breed at yeah. the top deck um, in South Bend. Um, but that was, uh, I think that was kind of, for me personally, playing with the Bear Facts and having the opportunity to travel uh, all over um, to play is what really got the bug into me. Uh, to travel, be a musician that travels and play venues uh, that are new venues all the time. So, uh, and and we did a lot of had a lot of fun with that. Uh. Had a lot of fun. I remember the uh, assistant principal, Mr. Hyde. Yeah. 
coming up to me at 11 o'clock on Friday morning and say, are you guys going to be here this afternoon? They'd let us leave to go play. Wow. And I, that's pretty wild, I think, you know, in, in, you know, in my memory. So. Yeah, back at the time. To being excused from school, you know, because you could go play. And I think they kind of thought we were heading that direction, you know, for a livelihood. So yeah. We fixed them. Yeah, and we, um, I think we, and again, I, you know, if memory's always foggy, but I think we were probably one of the um, first bands that actually um, had our own vehicle that had, you know, that we slept in, kept our equipment in and traveled around in and um, and uh, would play multiple cities uh, and locations on a weekend, uh, Friday night, Saturday night. Uh, I don't know, we did sometimes some, Sunday sometimes night. Sunday nights sometimes as well. Back to some time for school. Yeah, get back. So, I I think I I think the first time I talked to Dave, I told him I remember you buying your first car uh, while we were playing. Oh, yeah. and so, at least nice car. Uh, I didn't buy it. My dad bought it. Yeah. Oh, I, I have a story uh, when he, Dan talks about his dad. Uh, at the time, uh, things were were developing fairly quickly. And uh, so we, we needed to purchase some new equipment. And uh, so there was a place in South Bend called Crazy Jack's. And uh, Crazy Jack's was one of those uh, music stores that was known to deal really well and, and give you some great buys. And uh, Dan and I and his father uh, went over to Crazy Jack's and we walked in and really looking to buy quite a bit of equipment. And so Dan's dad had... Uh, Jack came over and Dan's dad said, uh, uh, so give me your best price on three dual showmen and I don't remember what else we were buying and Jack gave him his best price off the top of his head and I remember Dan's dad reaching in his pocket, he took some money out and gave the money to Dan and said, son, he says go down to the store and get us something to eat, we're going to be here a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he did end up making a deal. We walked out of there with a lot of a lot of stuff. So. <laughs> so now, if I remember right, you guys took the dual showmans and pyramided them. I, or, or was that the yeah. intruders that did that? Yeah, it may have been the intruders that did that. We, I know Dan was playing one, I was playing one, and Ron played one, right? Ron or Dave? Uh, one of the two, Ron or Dave. Um, um, I think that was... Uh, one of the other, uh, we were talking about Ron earlier, you know, Ron had a Baldwin 12 string right. that I just absolutely loved uh, the sound of that uh, guitar. Uh, and um, so I, instrumentally and vocally, I think we, it's great. we had, we had, we had some, some good stuff together. So if you, if you remember back to where you first started playing, I mean, like where you first said, okay, this is what I want to do. How old were you? For me, I was 12 years old. Yeah, uh, I got to say early teens somewhere. Yeah. 12 or 13, yeah. 14. I think the first band I played in, I'm not sure that I really even knew how to play at that time. I remember going to Russ Sanders to get guitar lessons up That's above Roxy. Yeah. Sure. And I took mine from uh, Carl Roach. Um, also at Roxy's, uh, probably practice more at his home um, uh, over on uh, Indiana Avenue, but uh, but back and forth. So, what was your biggest influence to play music? When you first started, you were 12, 13. What influenced you the most? I don't want to I, play football. I don't know. I just uh, I loved music, uh, and, and as I found out through most of my life, um, for me, music is just one opportunity to enjoy friendships, build um, relationships with people. There's there's something about the uh, journey. That tends to be more important to me. Uh, the people that I played with, uh, other musicians that I know uh, and have become uh, very good friends with. Uh, 
so what I've enjoyed about the experience more than anything is uh, those friendships. Cool. See, I remember I was probably nine or ten years old when I saw the Beatles and saw all the girls screaming. And up until that point, I was pretty shy. And uh, you know what? If this is what it takes to get girls screaming for you, that's what I did. So the Beatles was my influence to start. And Eb Wayne Scott was my first teacher. And when I heard Ed was over at Terry Calkins' house, and it was funny, you guys were practicing there. Yes. Um, Pete Murray, Pete Murray was your drummer back yes, then, he was. and I remember you guys had just blue floodlights, mm -hmm. and you played in the dining room for for practice. Yes. And once I heard that, I said, that's it. I'm I'm asking Ed to teach me how to play. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, that that first band that I was in, uh, our PA system was a 90 watt Bogan amplifier oh, with two 12 inch Man. fronts. Uh, and the, uh, in fact, that was the first band I play, played in with Pete uh, and Ed. It was called The Flames. Um, and uh, um, it just, like I said, so many, so many wonderful guys and gals that I've, that I've come to know uh, through the musical experience and, and uh, guys like Dan and, and other folks that become lifelong friends. Uh, and there's there's something about uh, as I mentioned the first time we talked, there's something about playing music, um, especially uh, having played music in the port, where there were so many musicians. Um, whether you played with all those music musicians or you just knew of those musicians, um, I think there was always a kind of a brotherhood or a, a camaraderie that exists. Uh, that even when you see each other today, if you haven't seen each other in, you know, okay. 10 years, 15 years, it's, uh, it's, it still exists. Still important. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, and, and Dan, we were talking earlier about how long you've been away from the port now. And so your, your playing time around the port was kind of limited. Pretty much, yeah. But Stop now you're... 69, so. So you're back into it again? Uh, not like I'd like to. I'm the guy who's going to retire and start a band. So there you go. <laughs> There's no time like now. <laughs> so. I, I can tell you those old high school. Uh, and again, I, I think unless you've experienced it, and for those people that see the video and and kind of live through those times, those high school dances will they'll never be replaced. Right. Um, uh, I just and from a band experience and having played with. A number of bands that played those activities, just so many different stories. I, I, I have to relate one to you that has to do with a, a band that I played with uh, with a with a fellow that died not too long ago, Larry Willoughby. Uh, Larry was a personality in and of himself, uh, and uh, at that time uh, there wasn't a lot of tech, technical expertise around, and so we were looking. Uh, at least Larry wanted to have some kind of a light show. So Larry had bought an electric fan, a box fan, that was probably you know two feet by two feet, and he had taken he had taken a piece of half inch plywood, and he had cut a section out of this uh, piece of plywood, and then mounted that plywood in place of the blade on the fan, and he would set it up uh, behind a light, and he would turn this fan on. And by God, it actually created kind of a strobe effect. The problem was that you couldn't turn it up past slow because it would lose its center of gravity and it would just start hopping all over the place and pretty soon it was <laughs> laying on its back. But just, I'm sure every musician that watches this has a similar stories to that. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think I've got more than a few of those. <laughs> So, Dan, you're talking about going back and, and starting up again. Well, I don't know how serious I am. I'd like to play. But well, you know. I need you guys to come over here to my living room to do that, like I told you. See, I don't want to travel, so. <laughs> or haul the junk. Mm -hmm. Well, you're or in be, the middle be, of nowhere, or be, so. Or be uh, disassembling and coming home at 4 o'clock in the morning, you know, so. 
Hey, Dan, you need to find yourself a little, uh, little one or two piece gig, you know, make a hundred bucks a night yeah, and, and have a PA that's about this big, you know. And yeah. Money isn't really an issue. So. <laughs> But, but you're, you're, what you're saying, and this is what I wanted to bring out, is your love of music and playing has always been there, even though you, you stopped. So reflect a little bit on that for us. What it, well, we just had a really good time. I mean, we were out of town every Friday and uh, gone most of the weekend and uh, had a lot of time together with the guys in the band and uh, a lot of good music, you know. And, uh, some stories you can't put on video, I guess, you know. Yeah. Well, those are the stories I, we're looking for. I, I remember putting Wes on the hood of my uh, 67 GTO trying to get through the fog down by, uh, <laughs> where were we? Down, I don't, down towards South Central, down that way, down North Judson yeah. that way, coming home at 3 o'clock in the morning a couple times. Yeah, you know, so. yeah. <laughs> And you put Wes on the hood. Well, I think Wes put himself on the hood. Well, we were. It was. We were trying to get home. It was very late. I remember that. Uh, very foggy. Yeah. Uh, there were just so many stories like that. Uh, we would go down and play fraternities um, at IU and Purdue and uh, Indiana State and Rose Polytech and all these places. And uh, you know, you're looking for something to do. So we used to back our van up and open the back door because it had big double doors on the back and and we would take shaving cream and put it on the handrails uh, going up these big sets of double steps and then we would sit back and just watch the reaction of people who would you know run up and it's surprising how many people don't look where you're putting your hands uh, and of course they'd have shaving cream up to here and kind of trying to throw it off and those kind of funny things but there were also touching uh, moments too we uh, there was a place in Burlington, Iowa, that we played a number of times, and, and you know, I don't remember the name of it. Oh, the Spider Web. And there was a a lady that owned it that had to be seventy years old. Uh, everybody just called her mom, uh, and her gift in life was to uh, keep this club open and, and let kids come in and enjoy themselves. And we always looked forward to going out there because she would fix a big meal for us uh, when we showed up. And we would all sit down and eat and play the club. And the club was always packed. And uh, it was uh, things like that. that uh, They were all on the second floor. Well. Everyone was on the second mm -hmm. floor. Never, maybe the third floor. Mm -hmm. You never, never had to move the equipment downhill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on the way in. On the way in. So what uh, what would be your best memory from playing in the Bear Facts? It's hard to point to a specific time. As I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the guys I played with probably my best memory. You had a lot more. Most bands, most people that will have played in bands will tell you that um, there's so much time and effort that goes into <coughs> making a band successful, uh, all the practicing, uh, all the logistics and getting everybody together and making it happen. Uh, and uh, it's during those times that, that uh, things become trying, uh, people lose tempers or get impatient and laugh and and joke with each other and uh, I would say my my most memorable uh, my most memorable thing are the are the guys that I did it with I, I think uh, one of the big things was the rush when you hoped you were going to make it big you know? I, I remember going to that recording se uh, session and uh, coming out of there and thinking man we had it this was it and we walked up and down Michigan Avenue at the time in Chicago, and they told us that that was really nice, but it sounds just like all the stuff that came out of Chicago about three years ago. You know, so. yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, it sounds, it sounds, all those horns and all that stuff sounds just like the, the Buckinghams and Blood, Sweat, and Tears and you know, some of the other stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I would say uh, uh, one of the things that I think all of us uh, really remembered and enjoyed was uh, when we had an opportunity to play at Orchestra Hall. Uh, in Chicago, 
uh, and we played there with a number of bands, Tommy James and the Shondells, uh, all of the major disc jockeys uh, in Chicago that were with WLS at the time, uh, Clark Weber and uh, um, Larry Lujak and uh, John Ron Riley, John Landecker, uh, all those guys were there. Um, and uh, that was that, that was really an experience and something that was, a big that time was really for us. fun. Yeah, yeah. So, um, just to look out off the stage, and if you haven't ever been to Orchestra Hall, it's still there. They still do major events there, but to look off the stage and, and, and see multiple balconies, you know, going up. What I my I guess my memory of the place was, it seemed like it was higher than it was deeper. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, you remember different things when you were uh, a kid. A big kick out I got out of, because we were getting airplay with uh, some of our songs out of Chicago. And just being able to turn on the radio, uh, Cat and the Drag in, Chica in uh, Laporte, and all of a sudden your song comes on and they're playing it. That, that has to be a rush. Uh, that uh, that you wouldn't forget, but I, I hadn't even had a second thought about it until we just you just mentioned that. Well, that's cool, and it's all about the memories. See, and that's the whole thing too is the people from Laporte, and I think that there is, and I don't mean in a bad way, pride, mm -hmm. but in a good way. They were proud of the musicians oh, yeah. that were from the area. I mean, and still today, mm -hmm. are very proud of that. Yeah. Um, and we created tons of musicians in the port. We talked earlier, there were 40-something working bands when, when you guys were playing. A lot of those people were influenced by what you did. Rich Wines, I mean, tremendous bass player, was influenced by you and Frank both. And I, I told you before, I remember being at your house. Yeah, I, it's funny, you don't think about those kinds of things. and. Uh, uh, yeah, I know Frank and I are our, our uh, history uh, because we're both bass players and those kinds of things. Our our paths have always been uh, you know been crossed through for decades and decades, and it's always been interesting because being two bass players, we're always playing with different bands all the time. Right. Uh, and uh, so I was always uh, um, I was always very interested in the things that. That Frank was doing ever since he played with the Trondells, uh, you know, on up, and uh, um, and uh, so I think that that's the other thing too, because we had so many musicians in that area. I think there was a there was a, a healthy competition uh, between those players, but I think at the same time uh, everybody really respected each other. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's advantage to being in a small town because. You would see each other at school on a regular basis, but I think the influence was was a big thing in the port, and I'm hoping that hasn't been lost. I, I think some of it has, but the influence that whoever you guys influenced would influence somebody else, and, and so on down the line. So it was this pyramid that just kept building of musicians in the port, and it was a great thing to see. Um, you said you took lessons from Russ. Yeah. yeah. So you for a while until I learned my seven chords and I was out of there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> had had Russ already at that point done Project Blue or? Oh no, no. I don't know when Project Blue. Hmm. It it that it's came out pretty know. early before before we got together. Probably about Russ's Project Blue. 66, 67 yeah. maybe? Well, it had yeah. to be then because yeah. that's about... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I can remember Russ performing that at the Civic no, I, with The End. Uh, um, the End I remember, mm -hmm. but I don't yeah. remember Project Blue. Sure. Yeah, the song yeah. that... Yeah. Oh, okay, yes, yes, I do remember. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, we played with them at the Civic uh, when I was playing with Ed Wayne Scott and Pete Murray and those guys and uh, Chris Kendall. Um, and I think we, uh, I think we ended up doing the same thing. We played Russ's song, uh, 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 playing on the same stage with Russ. I, you know, I, uh, but I, I remember the song. It was a great song. I interviewed Tom there, and uh, 
we were we were talking about when they played there, and I remembered. Hey Joe would take twenty five minutes for us to play. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and he did that before Jimi Hendrix did. Mm -hmm. And it was just amazing. And and we were thinking back, and, and one of the things that Tom said is we probably played jobs that we only played four songs. Oh, yeah. Just take an hour to do them, you know. Yeah. But so things were things were a little different back then. Yeah. But that's we're trying to relive this. We're we're really. It's great that you guys are interested in what's going on with people that used to be your fan base and that we're going to all pull it back together and bring everybody back together. Well, I, I think uh, I, Dan, I think, feels the same way. I, I, I've continued to play and, and been very active playing and still doing it, uh, but I would love nothing more than to have uh, the guys get back together and, and reunite even if it's uh, to do three or four songs just to see the guys and, and be up there with them again. Uh, you know, uh, Bob Neblong, our drummer, passed away a few years ago and uh, I was lucky enough to have gone down to Athens, Georgia and visit with Bob um, probably uh, a year or so before he died. Um, and uh, I know Bob came back up this way and we spent some time together. Um, but it, it would be something to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it would be nice. Well, see, now the challenge is on. Mm -hmm. So the two of you are willing to do it. Now we got to do is put this video on Facebook mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and get the other ones encouraged to come. Well, I, I will tell you that I've, ta I've talked with Jim Sipe, and uh, Jim is willing to come up from Texas. Uh, Ron Shaw, of course, uh, lives there in LaPorte, and Ron would be real excited about doing that. So... Uh, and I'm hoping that, uh, Dave, I'm hoping that you see this, uh, and we're going to be calling you, so uh, we'd like to get Dave Curtis here, and, and I think it would be a lot of fun. question was, the, the guy that played xylophone, and you guys were actually the ones that played with him. Yes. So, Yep, it was the bare facts, early bare facts. And, yeah, we. Uh, yeah, but, he was a computer engineer at Whirlpool, as I remember, and we were into kind of a jazzy band at the time, so it was nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. we were looking to do something totally different, and uh, we thought, geez, you know, uh, why not? Then I think we threw him away and got hoards. So. Yeah, I, I don't know who came up with the idea, but we did uh, bring in a xylophone player, and we played, uh, I don't know how many gigs with him. Uh, did things like uh, Archie Bell and the Drills and, you know, the Dells and those kinds of things. And actually, uh, I actually kind of enjoyed it, but it was, you know, how many how many rock songs can you get a xylophone True. involved in? So. Uh, and you remember his name being Joe, but you don't remember. Joe, and I can't remember his last name. Yeah. That was probably one of the most interesting things I'd ever seen yeah. with any band. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and the fact that we, I actually, you know, I think you can play chords and stuff with vibes oh, and, yeah. and stuff like that. I know a guy in Elkhart who plays uh, uh, vibes in, you know, and it's more of a jazz band, but it's yeah. pretty neat stuff. So. Yeah, and we we tried to feature him on some songs, but other than that, if you're right, Dan. Now that I think about it, uh, the other songs as we were playing those, he just played straight chords with. He had, you know, he would play. More than one, several mallets. several mallets at the same time. And I remember that. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember we were talking about the high school dances and yes. how much they... Yeah, I, we were talking earlier and I made, made a comment that uh, how could you have had a more progressive uh, or cooperative high school than what we had back in the day because, uh, I mean, they had fantastic stage setups. Uh, the, they they would really help the bands with their and they let us go Friday at noon and they let us go Friday at noon to go play our gigs so they can't get any better than that but I remember Battle of the Bands there um, I remember the New Colony Six uh, played there uh, and uh, I can remember Battle of the Bands uh, I don't remember who the third band was but uh, I remember we played as a Bear Fax and. Mike Jones and uh, and I think Frank uh, was uh, also with them. They were called the McGuppies uh, at the time. Um, so it was it was a, a really a great time to be a kid and be doing the things that we were doing. You know what? It still is a great time to be a kid for me. 
I'm going to relive it on May 18th. The one on the left I bought from Ron Shaw, he bought it somewhere and had a broken neck. It plays really nice. Um, I traded him another old Gibson lookalike I came upon 10 or 15 years ago. The black Gibson I bought in Lansing, Michigan about 12 or 14 years ago. And, uh, that's basically the closest to my baby from way back when. Other than that, I've got got an old Strat in the case that, I, again, I got from Ron. That, uh, and I've got four or five others that are different sorts of junkers that I've accumulated over the years. So. Yeah, and the guitar you played with, uh, <coughs> the guitar you played with in the Bear Facts, was it a red guitar? It was a red gold. It was a gold, wasn't it? It was red with yeah. gold trim, very similar to that. That had gold before it all tarnished. Yeah. 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 It was a Gibson 355 stereo, which I really liked. So I don't think it had gold tuners. I think it had white tuners. So it's only because I think I saw that on one of the old pictures. Yeah. Hello. If you don't know who it is, tell them just a minute, you know. But I've always been a Gibson guy. I like the Gibson real thin and narrow neck, which I thought was a Gibson trait. But as I uh, bought that and went to Kalamazoo to talk to some old Gibson guys. They said that was basically the guy who was running the neck machine that day. It had nothing to do with, it, with the company <laughs> thoughts or design or anything like that, which really surprised me. You know? <laughs> well, that's an interesting story. Oh, yeah. We were to be able to sell that one to somebody. Uh, I had a friend, I have a friend, and his dad had a, he kept calling it a Gibson Les Paul. And uh, we talked about it for 10 or 20 years. And his dad passed and they sold the Les Paul. And it turned out that his dad's Les Paul was an SG. And apparently Les Paul endorsed an SG style guitar also, I guess. Which wow. had two horns instead of the conventional Les Paul body style. So, uh, and I, I actually, I get, I get guitar player, I saw it in there one day, so then, then it all made sense. And then in talking to him, uh, we started talking about details on the body and found out that it wasn't the conventional Les Paul body, you know, so. Wow. Wes, you had another story you wanted to share with well, us. I, it was something that we talked about a little bit when we took a little break there, and uh, it, it's it's funny we talk about the musicians, but there are other people that in bands that are very successful, um, it's not just the musicians that make them that way. Uh, for the bare facts, uh, if it hadn't been for our parents, uh, and in our particular case, a guy named Jim Kimmel. Uh, who I believe still lives there in Laporte. Uh, Jim was a, a road manager that we had, um, and I don't want to I don't want to say that lightly because uh, I would say Jim was as much, if not more, interested in the success of the band than than maybe we were. I mean, we were enjoying and loving what we were doing, and we were getting the accolades. But you have a guy like Jim who's who's out there just promoting the heck out of you and and worrying twice as much as you are as about as to how the band's going to do and how they're going to be perceived. So I, I can't say enough about Jim. Uh, Jim's father, uh, I believe it was Russ. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what his dad's name was, but uh, Jim, but his dad, uh, Steve Kirkman's father, uh, if you remember back then, uh, we were still pretty much underage, yeah. uh, and uh, we were traveling all over the country. Uh, all of our parents signed an agreement uh, on the, the old tissue paper type typing paper, and they all signed allowing uh, uh, Jim's dad and uh, Steve's dad to, uh, to drive us around and take responsibility for us. So um, can't say enough about, uh, about those those pe those people there there were probably others that I can't remember but I can remember those three particularly and I remember I remember the bare facts I remember Jim but I remember uh, at one point Steve's dad really took a strong role with mm -hmm. with the band which as a kid I thought this is really unusual you know yeah. and mostly because my dad's active role was to turn the basement 
light on and off and go turn that shit down. You know, so. well, you know Steve, I thought, Steve was an excellent singer. Yeah. Uh, but Steve's and, dad was really dedicated to us. He went out and bought a, I think a 65 or a 66 Dodge, was it a Ford van, van mm -hmm. uh, to haul our stuff, you know. And uh, that was before we were old enough to drive. And he would drag us all over the place and spend the night with us. And, you, know. you know, I think that was, uh, that was one of the other things uh, when you talk about originality and those types of things. There were not... Uh, very many bands back there that actually featured lead singers uh, that were stand-up, out-front guys. Uh, I know um, uh, the Riddlers did, um, and uh, and I know we did uh, with both Jim and uh, and Steve. Um, and uh, you didn't see that a lot, right? Yeah, that was that was unusual. Mm -hmm. I know from from that period, I mean, there have been some musicians that have gone on and continued to do it, um, but even the bands today that I remember from back then didn't have the front guys. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, too, that I thought was, uh, I want to give a lot of credit to, uh, we were a six-piece band. But we played the same as an eight-piece band. I mean, when you have uh, a keyboard player uh, and Dave Curtis who could play keys and trumpet at the same time, uh, and then you have Ron who played, you know, uh, guitar, lead guitar and guitar, and then would switch right in the middle of a song to a trumpet, uh, so you could have dual horns going. Uh, I, I don't think you found too many bands that. We're able to do that as well. And Bob used to play sax. Too. Yeah, and Bob Nebelung played saxophone. <coughs> <coughs> yes, he did. I had forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah. not a lot. Several songs, you know. So. I, and I don't remember Bob playing sax. Yeah, yeah. But well, you didn't have a lot of bands that had horns back right, then. Right, there were very few. Yeah. There was some music coming out about that time frame with some, but. I remember driving back from uh, seeing my wife at uh, 11 o'clock on Sunday night and listening to, what's the, what's the rock station that's out there, WRBR? WAOR. Uh, WAOR, I don't, that don't sound right, but there was an underground rock station in 66 or 67 that used to play uh, Blood, Sweat and Tears in their earliest form. and. Uh, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. Oh yeah, and, great band. And I've always loved Paul Butterfield. I've never been able to find more than one or two songs from him. I don't know why, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that he did very many. You know, so. So if there's anybody that sees this, if they can get you a copy and bring it May 18th, I'd, I'd take it. You'd appreciate it. Yeah. Yes. Or, yeah, so. <laughs> I, I know when you play that, it's going to have all that conversation in the background. <laughs> Actually, it's supposed to. Yeah, but you guys got louder as we did. It's supposed to <laughs> just direct towards oh, the. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, we'll we'll find out. Okay. Go ahead with that all over again. All right. Uh, it was uh, late 1969. Um, we had graduated from high school, or we're, we're just getting ready to. Uh, as I remember, it was fairly cold at the time, so I'm thinking that we may have already been graduated. Uh, but at, but we were looking at go, whether we were going on to college, uh, whether we were, uh, the Vietnam War was still going on pretty strong. So, uh, you know, there was a, uh, a thought of being drafted. They had the, uh, the lottery going on at that time. I think it was the first year of the lottery or the second year. And... Uh, Plus, music was changing. Um, we were lucky enough, uh, Sun Productions uh, was the booking agency that had been working with us, and we were lucky enough to be picked up by Willard Alexander, which was one of the largest booking agencies in the country. And they looked at the band and was looking at taking us in a different direction. Music was changing. Uh, psychedelic music was coming in, things were getting a little, music was getting a little harder, a little rougher um, from the standpoint of the sound. And so uh, their, their idea was to have us put uh, pants 
as tight a pants on as we could get. Uh, I think one of the comments that I heard was, uh, we'll, we'll have you put these pants on and we'll even have you sit in the bathtub uh, and we'll try to shrink them down, okay? <laughs> uh, and uh, wanted us to play pretty much without shirts on. Uh, those were the kinds of things that they were talking about. So really looking at going to a much rougher look on the band. And I'm going to let Dan speak. I wonder if I was there then. I wonder if yeah. that was after I quit. You, you could have. Well, I think you were still there. I think I you mean, still I, had the hair on your chest. <laughs> the hair on my chest? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, see, I don't remember that. Yeah. I, I, I wonder I, if that was like the fall of 69. It, it could have been. summer. So. I, I remember uh, all of us, we had just played a club. And we were all sitting. It was cold. It was a parking lot. We were sitting sitting around, at least unless my memory is slipping and I don't remember as well, but uh, but I, I know for me the decision I had to make was that uh, I had a significant uh, other, I had some other plans in my life that, that I wanted. I wanted to go to college um, and to me, as I mentioned before, playing music is all about the friendships, the camaraderie, the journey, um, and I love entertainment. And what entertainment means to me personally is not so much the music I'm playing, but whatever I'm playing, doing it well, uh, and doing it with a group of people that I really love doing it with. So uh, the decision for me was that uh, I had other things that I wanted to do in my life, and that wasn't particularly the type of thing that I was interested in doing. So um, I kind of yeah. So I kind of chose to move on. And Dan, you, you're I need to say. So did did any of the bear facts ever get into the tight jeans? You know, I, they, uh, they'd have to answer that question. Uh, that would have to be Dave and Ron and, and Harold and. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, I've I, I've seen some pictures of the band uh, some years later. Uh, they certainly didn't look to me like they were in, you know, tight white pants and shirtless. But um, but that, that's something that they would have to answer. I've always been one of those people that. Uh, if I choose to give up playing, I give it up cold turkey. Uh, I don't want to be in a club. I don't want to be someplace where another band is playing uh, because I really love it. And it's hard for me to be around it without doing it. So once I left the band, uh, I, just, I just quit it cold turkey and, and just did other things in my life. And that was it. Same with you, Dan? Pretty much. So at what point did you come back? Uh, well, it's like uh, a lot of musicians. Uh, you really begin to miss it. You have some people that may call you and try to see what you're doing, what are you interested in doing, um, and the next one thing leads to another, and pretty soon you're practicing, and then you're playing, uh, and I tend to go into everything that I do really gung ho. Uh, so I would, when I came back, I came back and played with a band for probably five or six years, and then did the did the same thing again. I cold turkeyed it um, uh, for about two or three years, and then did the same thing and came back. And I've just been. Playing. And I haven't got back yet. I'm going to do that when I retire. <laughs> so in May, you're coming back. I'm not, I may come back to La Porte, but I haven't got back to play. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got a spot open for Dan if he wants to come back. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> you know, the last time we covered, you played with Larry Caper. Yes. Yeah, I played, uh, uh, I've been lucky to play with so many different gr wonderful guys. Um, Larry Capron and uh, Phil Newman. Um, of course, uh, Bob Neblong. I, there's so many drummers that I've that uh, that I've played with. Uh, you know, Pete Murray was a drummer for us at one time. Um, just some. I played with some really. Jerry Farnsworth uh, was a guitar player that I played with. Uh, John Hilgendorf uh, was a keyboard player that I played with. Uh, just a lot of Chris Kendall, guitar player. A lot of wonderful, wonderful people. Cool. Uh, and you, Dan? I'm still waiting to start again. So. <laughs> I keep telling Dan we have a spot for him. 
uh, in the band I'm playing with now. So, really? Yeah, yeah. We were we had six pieces and uh, lost an individual uh, that uh, that wanted to keep playing but just physically couldn't do it, and and uh, so we we we've been at a five piece group for the last three or four years and always wanted to add a good guitar player. So there's an offer. Never can tell. There's an offer. <laughs> And what band are you playing with now? Uh, right now, believe it or not, I've I, I, I've totally switched genres. Uh, uh, you know, playing with Dan and the guys doing Motown and and a lot of horn stuff to playing classic rock and rock like everybody did, and uh, got an opportunity about almost 15 years ago now uh, to do country music, and been doing country music with the same band for the last 15 years. Uh, having one heck of a fun time doing it and doing a lot of a lot of great things. Cool. Yeah. You even did a European tour, did you? Yes, we did. We were real lucky. We we actually uh, released a CD, uh, or actually a promoter did out of Phoenix, Arizona, and we ended up with the number one country music song in Europe. And uh, we were asked to come over, and we did a couple of concerts, and and uh, so we. We don't play a lot in the LaPorte area, mostly Illinois, uh, Ohio, Michigan, southern Indiana, so um, don't see a lot of people in that area very much, but miss a lot of people. Well, you'll have your opportunity again. I hope so. Yeah, I hope with Dan and the rest of the guys. We hope so, too. Yeah. We'll see you in May.